This is the Mohawk Valley in the center of New York State, the heart of dairy country. As Route 12 winds its way south, it passes a historical marker that declares its position to be the western boundary of civilization. Beyond this boundary is Waterville, my hometown. It's Easter, and my father Joe is performing a yearly ritual, hiding plastic eggs for our Easter egg hunt. The egg hunt has been a favorite in our family since my sister Jessica, brother Mike, and I could walk. Okay, go. go. Of course now, Jessica is a lawyer, and Mike is a systems consultant, and I am a documentary filmmaker. And the youngest hunt participant is my 17-year-old cousin, Patrick. But this has not deterred my mother from insisting that we regress to our childhood. You see, my mom, Kelly, is a big believer in reliving our family history. So it's a comfort to her that while she is in the kitchen wrestling with the jello mold, we are somewhere outside upholding tradition, no matter how embarrassing. Now that's a good Easter candy. <laughs> Tums. <laughs> Alas, long gone are the candy treasures of our youth. Nowadays, the plastic eggs contain Tums antacid, shoe polish wipes, paper clips, erasers, and post-it notes. A subtle reminder that it's not 1976, and I'm not eight years old. All kinds of stuff in there. It just feels like I am. <laughs> My mother's love of family history is what got her interested in the Loomis family in the first place. In many ways, the Loomises were just like us. They grew up here, loved a good party, and were highly sophisticated. But unlike us, they commanded what may have been the largest family crime syndicate in 19th century America. This is their story, past and present. Waterville is a village of 1,500 people. When you grow up in a small place, you tend to spend a lot of time dreaming of bigger places, which is why, I guess, I managed to learn absolutely nothing about local history as a kid. It's only now, when I look at Waterville's quickie marts and hair salons, that I'm eager to learn about the glory days, when Waterville was a happening place. The images I collected from the attic of the local library make it pretty clear that those glory days were the 1800s. That's when Waterville laid claim to being the hops capital of the country, referring to the pungent vine-grown buds that flavor beer. The village was in the midst of hop dominance in 1854, when George Eastman, founder of Eastman Kodak, was born here destined to put Little Waterville on the map. And then there's the Loomis Gang. There are only a few good pictures of them, so I asked local art teacher Sally Glaus and her husband John to recreate them in wood, their specialty. 
Now, it's an understatement to say that these outlaws are not as well known as beer or the Instamatic camera. But in the years surrounding the Civil War, Loomis' exploits rivaled those of Billy the Kid, Jesse James, and Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kid, and their Wild Bunch. But unlike those guys, the Loomis gang has spent the better part of the last century teetering on the brink of historical extinction. Denied today's camera-friendly historians and big-budget movies and action figures. If you want to promote something in a small town, a good way to do it is with a festival. People love them. This particular festival is Waterville's yearly Nostalgia Days, and its most unique feature is the Loomis Gang bus tour. It's here that I see the gang's only hope, embodied in a small group of history amateurs that includes my mom, Kelly, Larry Brooks, who owns a campground, local school teacher, Brian Bogan, psychiatrist, Dr. E. Fuller Torrey, Dorothy D'Angelo, who calls herself a retired school transportation professional, and real life Loomis, Roseanne Gay. It is a sunny Saturday morning they have costumes and bus tickets for four bucks, and two empty school buses. The only thing they have not planned for is what to do if nobody buys a ticket. Because in Waterville, it's pretty easy to forget the Loomis Gang. When we moved here in 1972, my parents promptly immersed themselves into the local history scene. It wasn't long before Mom came home with a book titled The Loomis Gang. I have dim memories of the pale green cover on the shelf, but never opened it once while I lived here. It turns out that the book is a collection of articles and letters and word-of-mouth stories gathered by area newspaper man George Walter in 1953. It is important to note that almost all of what is known or assumed about the gang can be found in Walter's book. At that time, the drugstore also carried books, and one of the books was the Loomis Gang book, the Walter book, and I bought it, only $4.95. It was fascinating to think that these people had actually lived here and done all these things. Those things all started right here, Gorton's store, when I was 16, my friends and I tried to buy beer here. And it was said that comic crooner Tiny Tim once stopped in for some Cheetos or something. Little did I know that this house is historically important for another reason. It was originally the home of Dr. Stephen Preston and his wife, Clarissa Loomis Preston. In 1802, George Loomis, who was Clarissa's brother and a wanted man in Vermont, knocked on their door. George was a great lover of horses, and if uh, he couldn't afford the horse, he just took it. He had been in Vermont stealing horses and running them down to Connecticut for sale. The story goes that the sheriff there and a posse were right behind him when he crossed the border from Vermont into New York State. He brought quite a bit of money with him in his saddlebags, and he liked the area. So he decided he was going to buy some land and he had the money to do it. George's land purchase came to be known as the Loomis Pinnacle, or the less flashy Loomis Knob. It's only a five minute drive from our house, and it's mom's favorite spot when she talks with visitors about the Loomis Gang. Originally, when George Loomis came to this area, he looked was looking for a certain kind of land. It had to be situated in a high position so that he would have a good lookout for any of his activities. And as you can see, the view from here is just fantastic. Right here in their own homes, they could tell when people were coming from his, uh, a great distance away. They claimed they had like a 10 mile view. So, so much more they could see horsemen approaching their house. With a new hill to call home, George set about looking for a wife. Rhoda Mallet, the beautiful daughter of a local counterfeiter, seemed a perfect match, and he married her in 1814. 
Next came children. They had 12, 10 of whom survived childhood. And they started their educations in a small schoolhouse like this one on the outskirts of the village. But as they grew older, when other kids were staying home to work the farms, the Loomises continued their studies. They were very well educated. Um, actually, they took the New York Times, and you, you wonder how many, how many farm families took the New York newspaper, how many farm families took any newspaper. After they left the schoolhouse, the Loomis boys apprenticed with lawyers and tradesmen, and the girls studied writing and piano. To treat the women equally in the sense that they were sent to fine schools, they were given the opportunity for education, this was very unusual at that time. Rhoda and George Loomis Sr. Uh, were very progressive in their views uh, regarding education. Uh, that also is, I think, one of the intriguing things about them. How could a family as educated and progressive um, become a family of outlaws? Very unusual. This irony was best embodied in Hiram Denio Loomis, the youngest boy, who grew into this imposing adult. While he was named for an honorable judge who was a champion of public education, Denio, like his siblings, learned his most important lessons at home. George Loomis taught his kids the stories of the United Indians, all this land around here originally belonged to the Oneidas, and Governor George Clinton and other land uh, speculators, including George Washington, these people gobble up the land. They bought it at one-tenth of a cent per acre. Uh, by the time George Loomis came out here, and he paid $15 per acre. He would tell his kids, well, you know, the politicians are all making all this money stealing from the Indians, so everybody's stealing, so we can do it, it's all right. Just don't get caught and be the best ones at it. Rhoda, more than George, I would say, taught her children to steal, and they were praised come back home with something, a pen knife, uh, someone's handkerchief, but you should come home with something. And they were praised. They were punished only if they got caught. George built a large house for his growing family, rendered here in ink by local artist Philippa Brown. The Loomis home was said to have included secret hiding places, and the Loomis kids, girls included, spent their adolescence filling those places with stolen stuff. Cornelia Loomis's natural talent for this work earned her the title Outlaw Queen. Well, the girls went to a party and it was in the winter and of course the custom of the day was that ladies wore a fur muff over their hands to keep them warm. Anyway, one of the girls went in to the bedroom where the coats were laid out. and She came out of the room saying, our, our muffs are gone. And evidently there had been enough suspicion of the Loomis girls that one person walked right over and pulled up um, Cornelia's skirts and there were the muffs strung just like beads up her legs. And needless to say, those girls weren't invited to uh, those parties again. <laughs> the boss says do this documentary. <laughs> I've convinced a family friend and equestrian, Sherry Wright, to help me get into the Loomis spirit by taking a horse ride. In order Sorry. to do this, we've assured a local stable that I am an experienced horseman, which is not exactly true. Don't hit the car. While Cornelia and her sisters swiped fur muffs, the Loomis brothers set their sights on stealing, disguising, and selling horses, a legacy left them by their father. They take a black horse and they put hot potatoes on the horse and change it ever so often, so many minutes, and that would bleach out the black hair until they got a black and white horse. And they keep going all over the horse until they had a horse that they wouldn't recognize. And it was even said that on some occasions they sold a stolen horse right back to the owner because the owner did not recognize the horse. Oh, my fave, my fave is Grove, because he was a, uh, a horseman. He did that honestly. That was one of the honest things, was to improve the line of horses. And I think that was neat. Grove Loomis, the third born son, was the true horse lover of the family. And while our horses are not about to win any races, Grove's interest in breeding produced one of the greatest racers of all time, Flora Temple. <laughs> Flora 
temple was the racehorse. It's very, very famous. And she was the product of a mayor whose name was Madam Temple and Grove Loomis's horse, a hunter. Currier and Ives made lithographs of her. Cigars were named for her and steamboats. And Stephen Foster memorialized her in the song Camp Town Races, I Bet My Money on the Bobtailed Nag. Well, the Bobtailed Nag is for our temple. And it lived to be 32 years old. And the first uh, time it ran the race at two minutes and 19 seconds. The record for the world was two minutes and 20 seconds. And uh, it became the most famous horse in the world. In 1852, the Loomises held a meeting on the Pinnacle to discuss the state of their gang. Much had changed since George had ridden into town 50 years before. For starters, George had died in 1851 at the age of 72. Rhoda, despite washing her face each day with a dew-soaked cloth, was not aging gracefully, as this rare photo indicates. And the gang was in the hands of her son. George Washington Loomis, Jr. Friends and enemies alike called him simply Wash. He had that charisma. He was good looking. He dressed well. He was popular with women. He was not the firstborn of the the Loomises because the first son, of course, is Bill. Normally, you name the first son after the father. But Bill, who they said did not have much mental activity, was named William. A raid on the homestead in 1848 had resulted in arrests and an extended vacation for Wash in the California gold rush. So Wash and Grove decided to change the way the family did business. Wash and Grove were very ambitious. They rapidly evolved a modus operandi uh, that I think came out of that original meeting whereby they would do less of the stealing themselves that they would basically subcontract the stealing and become middlemen in the operation, which kept their hands a little bit cleaner and became very rapidly a much more lucrative operation. Rather than, you know, four or five family members stealing, they had probably at the height at least 200 people who were part of this network. As they got organized and organized, their activity spread from Canada all the way down to Virginia, all the way east to relatives in Vermont, Connecticut, and then all the, all the way out west, the Finger Lakes area of uh, western New York. So they, they, were, they were huge. They were really well spread out. Armed with money and charm, Wash traveled off into Albany, the state capital, to act as a one-man lobby for the Loomis cause. Wash Loomis found it uh, relatively easy to go to Albany and uh, buy whatever protection he needed from the legislature. In fact, it almost seems to be the rule that uh, the legislators were uh, on the take. The sheriffs, the law enforcement officials at all levels um, seem to be on the take. And where bribery failed, the Loomises could always count on violence and intimidation. Even today, arson is like one of the most difficult things to prosecute and convict someone on. And in those days, the arson was just you know, one, of their, one of their weapons that was a very effective weapon. Uh, so people worked very hard to build up their farms and just one big barn fire, there you go. You, you, know, you lose everything you've worked your whole life for. Uh, you just didn't want to cross them. Between the bribings and burnings, The Loomis gang owned Waterville and the surrounding hamlets. And early attempts to deal with them were unsuccessful. North Brookfield had started a vigilante group and they were supposed to stop all this thieving and uh, having these secret meetings and who walks into one of their meetings to join up and pay their dues was Wash and Grove Loomis. Yeah, we want to join this vigilante group to stop the thieving around here. And they dropped their money on the table and walked out laughing. And then the people said, "Uh uh-oh, we've been found out and they didn't have a meeting again. It would take a very special person to face the Loomis gang, and that's just who came along. He really hated the Loomises. And he just was relentless, I guess would be the word. This is a man who either was not very smart or didn't much care whether he lived or not.
My name is Larry Brooks and we own Canyon Campground and uh, my wife taught history in the fifth grade and that's how I got interested in the Loomis Gang. It's part of the history of this area and I think there's a lot of people who like to know about the history in this part of the country. And there's not that much history going on. Larry occasionally offers his campers Loomis Gang tours dressed as the gang's arch enemy, Sheriff Jim Filkins. I kind of like that part of it. Portraying the, the part of the sheriff, it, it feels like you're part of that, that time. It's just like being there. Not so much the violence, I don't go for the violence, but, uh, and it's the history too. It's the history of the whole thing. Well, he was probably as bad as the Loomises. That's the only way that uh, uh, he, got it, took advantage of him because he more or less knew what the Loomises were doing. What the Loomises were doing when Jim Filkins hit the scene is immortalized in Larry's miniature golf course. Well, Sammy, he kind of reminds me of uh, Slippery Sam. Kind of like the Loomises, how slippery they were in a lot of their actions they did. The Ferris wheel kind of reminds me of the Brookfield Fair. When uh, Loomises went in there and stole the show horse, drove right out through the people. One of the, the gang members used to go to church on Sunday and he'd stand at the door greeting the people as they come in. And after he'd get all through, he'd go out and rob the farmers at night. A lot of the Loomises get caught and they put in jail. Well, George knew enough about the law and he would get them out of jail every time they got into trouble. Based on a description in the Loomis book, it seems Sheriff Filkins was not exactly the white hat type. Filkins, then 34 years old, had a pasty, pot-marked face set off by a sandy goatee and hair of the same color. Though he stood five feet, eight inches in height, his heavily muscled body and shuffled gait made him appear shorter. An introvert, the little constable, was known to have an uncontrollable temper. He had a great animosity toward the Loomises and there are different stories or theories of why. One was that he and Wash were both um, trying to court the same girl, and the girl preferred Wash to Filkins. Supposedly, he has spent some time in jail himself. He may have been guilty. He may have been with the Loomises. Uh, he may have been framed by the Loomises. They were brighter than most. Uh, they were better educated than most. They probably looked down on Filkins. They may have made fun of him. Uh, they may have ridiculed him. I think all of these things are possible. North Brookfield is a few miles south of Waterville. My brother and I spent one summer here painting a house and listening to classic rock on the radio. And the local hardware store is the only one I know that also serves breakfast. In 1858, Jim Filkins was elected sheriff here. He had run unopposed. A few months later, he arrested his first Loomis brother, Plum, for sheep stealing. More arrests and unwelcome visits to the Loomis pinnacle followed. I just can imagine how he'd raid the house. The only time he could raid the, raid the farmhouse was at midnight because they had lookouts on the outside of the, their property watching for them come during the day. The rivalry between Filkins and the Loomis gang produced daring exploits that would later become Hollywood cliches. Filkins made a raid, arrested Plum, brought him over to a hotel that had Plum there as a prisoner. Well, in the middle of the night, the guard had fallen asleep, and then Plum went out the second floor window, jumped down to the horses that Grove had waiting down there for him, and they escaped. What you got there, boy? The wash was in the... Madison Jail, and he had been in there for a month when his mother sent him a mincemeat pie, and she had baked files in the pie. And for whatever reason, his jailer, he did cut into it, and of course he hit the files. And he said to Wash, does your mother always uh, bake files in pie? And he said, what kind of pie? And the jailer said, mince. And Wash said, yes, she always puts files in mince pie. Loomis's used to be going down the road and uh, Bilkin's chasing them, shooting at them, and taking off down, and, uh, and 
farmers chasing them with the horses and bullets flying around, and it was quite a time. All of this fun was interrupted on April 12, 1861. Soldiers from the rebellious southern states fired on Fort Sumter, and suddenly the country was at war with itself. The impact of the Civil War would soon be felt by everyone, Filkins and the Loomis Gang included. The Civil War days, these were the, the glory days, the heydays of the, uh, the Loomis Gang. My wife says I've written more history than I've read, and um, she claims I don't really know very much history, so I'm learning as I go along. Clinical and research psychiatrist Dr. E. Fuller Torrey grew up in Clinton, New York, a few miles from Waterville. He has written such books as Surviving Schizophrenia and Freudian Fraud, The Malignant Effect of Freud's Theory on American Thought and Culture, and in 1994, Frontier Justice, The Rise and Fall of the Loomis Gang. I do spend most of my time on research on schizophrenia and manic depression, but I also like to write and I like good stories. And I became increasingly curious about the characters. George Walter's book has a lot of the facts in there, but the story as he told it was kind of uh, an isolated, cold story as if they operated independently of what was going on around them. And yet, uh, obviously, it didn't take very much uh, research to realize that much of this was going on during the Civil War. This was a much better story than just kind of a, uh, an Eastern Western as it is. This was really a story about American history. And I ended up using the wider context to understand the Loomises themselves. The Loomises, of course, were, were fantastic horse thieves, and the Civil War pre presented a market for them, which was unbelievable. The North had trouble getting enough horses, whereas in the South, which was much more rural, horses were much more plentiful for the, for the uh, Southern cavalry. And the Loomises were more than willing to sell horses. And it was even said that they would sell to the Union and then later on re-steal those horses and sell back to the, the Union again. So they, they just made a fabulous amount of money. This new business expansion created special challenges. For instance, where does one hide dozens of stolen horses before they can be shipped to their buyers? The answer was only a few hundred yards from the Loomis front porch. Well, the Nine Mile Swamp, of course, starts just about um, this side of Route 20 and extends all the way down to Hubbardsville. And it is treacherous if you don't know what you're doing. They knew the swamp like the back of their hand, and they were able to uh, bring stolen horses in safely without losing them because the swamp being a swamp, of course, has a lot of mire and suck holes and everything else. What better place for a family outing? What is this, Joe? Is this a sheep shack? The Loomis Gang and Nine Mile Swamp go together. I don't think you can really have one without the other. You can go in and get your feet wet and be lost before you know it. And, well, there are other things down there. I don't want to upset anybody, but they're snapping turtles, and they can talk to you. Good ones. Local artist Philippa Brown and her husband Dick are swamp enthusiasts and willing guides for our expedition. We're hoping to catch a glimpse of the legendary Hidden Meadow, where the gang allegedly graze their stolen herds. Our intrepid guides get off to a shaky start. That's known as the curse of the Loomis gang. But soon we are paddling along the serpentine river that cuts through the heart of the swamp. This is Loomis country. When we came, came east from Kansas, all the roads were straight, and you could look in the rearview mirror and see what you did yesterday, and look out the front window and see what you're going to do today. But there's always a new excitement here because it's, you're always going around the bend, and you don't know what you're going to see. How big a snake was it, Joe? Loomis gang curse or not, our attempt to look for the hidden meadow on shore quickly meets with disaster. Did you get that? <laughs> oh, man. 
do you think the Loomises would have done? <laughs> Dad followed up mom's performance by flipping the canoe while reaching for a bouquet of wild watercress. He just leaned and... Uh, yeah, I leaned. And... It makes me wonder how the gang did it so gracefully. All of the stories tell about men and, and some of the women of the Loomis Company fleeing from the authorities by running down the hill and into the swamp. I don't know how you do it. Oh, but they did. If they did, they might have had trails all worked out. Mm -hmm. They might have met, built corduroy roads and trails. In addition to wood plank corduroy roads, there are even rumors of pontoon bridges used to escort horses to dry land. Something we could use right now. What does it feel like being in the kind of the land of the Loomises here? Well, it is kind of, it's kind of neat. It's kind of spooky though, I think. I mean, you almost expect them to come out of around a bush or something. They really never did find their horse area that they hid things in. And neither did we. After trudging around in the muck and brambles for a while, we finally concede defeat and head for home. A mysterious wind picks up out of nowhere to help us along. It just goes to show you that they had an advantage over their pursuers. They knew exactly where to step and where to bring things in. The Nine Mile Swamp and Loomis Gang ghosts may have gotten the best of us today. But nobody ever said that witnessing history was easy. Oh, look at this. I am. I'm bringing part of the swamp with me. I suppose we can take some soggy okay. satisfaction from the struggle. Say Loomis. Loomis! Whoa. While stealing, hiding, and selling stolen horses remain the gang's main business, the Civil War provided another profitable opportunity. They would have members of their gang go sign up to become soldiers, get their bounty money, reward money, whatever you'd call it there for signing up. Then they'd report, and then they'd desert and come back to Loomis's, split the money with them. And then they'd go sign up someplace else. They got an added bonus in 1862 when Jim Filkins came up for re-election in North Brookfield. And Filkins lost the election by a very small number of votes. Probably the Loomises were able to control that election. Waterville decided that they would make a place for him to continue the, his effort of getting the Loomises out of power. The sheriff's move to Waterville was the inspiration of W.J. Bissell, owner of the local dry goods store. Dissel called a meeting and said, let's offer him the job. So Filkins had to move to Waterville, and once he had established his residency, he was appointed sheriff. Now in Waterville, the battle between the lawman and the horse thieves got serious. They were really getting fed up with all these raids. And they, his idea was he would just continually harass them, harass them, harass them. They'd be so busy defending themselves in court that it would, that would uh, interrupt their flow of operation and so on. Loomis went to Higginsville, which is above Oneida, and he took out a warrant on Filkins. That's the only place they could get a warrant to have him arrested. So they were, they were taking him over. As, as they were going down the road, they took a side road. Well, he got a little suspicious. So he uh, kicked one of them off the wagon and he jumped off and ran down through into the woods. He was still handcuffed, but he got away from them. So they were, they were up to something. They were no good. They were either going to do away with him or shoot him. Filkins was at home one night and he heard a knock at the door. He went to the door and a voice called out and he recognized the voice as being that of Plum Loomis. He stepped back away from the door. Then shots just rang out, shooting right through the window, the curtains, and into the room. Filkins' wife screamed, and he fell to the floor. He was shot, but not mortally. Miraculously, his wife and two children were not hurt at all. Um, next day, they counted 47 bullet holes uh, through the curtains and um, shot in the uh, mantelpiece. Now people saw how dangerous and violent the Loomises could be, so they really stepped up the resistance another notch against them. It was more than just, you know, things disappearing now. Considering the normally cool-headed command of Wash Loomis, 
the attack on Filkins looked pretty clumsy. The fact that his younger brothers, Plum and Denio, were later indicted for the crime suggests that all was not well at the Loomis dinner table. Wash and his mother grew apart. Wash and Grove remained very, very close. Whereas the younger boys, especially uh, Plum and especially Daniel, tended to stay with the mother. Wash wanted a huge network. Rhoda wanted a very small gang of practically all family members and a few close friends because she did not want to divide up the spoils among a lot of people. A bothersome sheriff and family feuds were the first hints of trouble for a gang that was riding high. I'm reminded of, of the story of uh, George Mallory uh, who climbed uh, Mount Everest did he climb it or did he not climb it? Well, he was going to anyway, and they asked him why, and he said, because it's there. And that's kind of how I feel about history. Uh, the reason I pursue it is because it was there, and I think uh, families and, and events uh, deserve to be um, researched and, and learned about. They happened, and therefore they are. It's a beautiful summer evening, and Dorothy D'Angelo is performing her Loomis presentation for me at the old courthouse in Morrisville, a few miles over the county line from Waterville. If I were to tell you that there was a family not too far from here who engaged in, well, not totally legal endeavors, why, you might think I was describing a crime family from New York City or, or Chicago. In doing presentations, you have to get their attention and then tell them what you're going to tell them. So that's my little gimmick of getting their attention, uh, coming in and kind of slinking and, and saying, if I were to tell you, and everybody says, gee, what is she going to tell us? You know, and I said, uh, you know, there's a family down the road, and then I tell a little more, and they say, oh, wow, this is good. Travelers Insurance Company, uh, they put out calendars, and this is one with Flora Temple on it. Dorothy will willingly show off her props and slides and enthusiasm anywhere she is asked. But this old courthouse is special. It's only a replica of the original, and that is thanks to the Loomis Gang. Another one of their escapades was the burning of the Madison County Courthouse. Unfortunately, there were some indictments uh, for the arrest of some of the Loomis boys. And so in order to avoid uh, court, they burned down the courthouse. It seemed like a good plan to them. The date was October 10th, 1864. Over the years, the Loomises had made a regular practice of torching indictments and evidence and the buildings that held them. So burning down the courthouse should have been a yawn but it was just the way they did it. The whole courthouse erupts in flames. And to show the, the brass, the chutzpah that Wash had, is he'd gone into the fire department and chopped up with an ax the fire hose. And so when the alarm goes off, the people of Morrisville go to get the fire hose and they hook it up. And here's Wash right in line with all the people, holding the fire hose. And of course, when they turn the water on, it's like a sprinkler going all over the place with all the holes in the to not only burn down the courthouse, but to have sabotaged the ability to put out the fire and then turn up and say, can we help you put the fire out? If you didn't have that kind of chutzpah, you think, gee, they might kill us. I mean, they, they know we must have started fire. Uh, but rather than kind of watching from the sidelines, we'll go in and say, you know, can we help you put it out? I found that extraordinary. The courthouse burned to the ground. Wash was heard to, to say, who would ever do such a dastardly deed? I can't believe anyone would ever, you know, stoop to being that low. So all of the indictments then were wiped out. Their slate was clean. They were free. And so was the country. On April 8, 1865, Robert E. Lee surrendered the Confederacy to Ulysses S. Grant 
and the Civil War was over. When I was a Boy Scout, I myself marched up Main Street every Memorial Day. I realized when I saw these old pictures that each year I was retracing the steps of the proud men of Waterville who marched home from the war. They were probably not very happy to find a rejuvenated Loomis gang in charge. When the veterans came home from the Civil War, they were just beside themselves. They had been sleeping out, struggling, in fear of losing their life every day, and to come home to find out that you know they had stolen and burned and, and done all their depredations all in this area, these veterans who were now seasoned soldiers um, decided they were, they were going to join up with the people who were trying to get rid of the Loomises. Shopkeeper W.J. Bissell collected these veterans and other concerned citizens and created the Sangerfield Vigilante Committee in the room above his store. Although the store has melted into part of the Castlewood restaurant on Main Street, the outlines of the windows are still visible. The password was HOPS to get into these secret meetings, and they started planning different strategies of how they could deal with the Loomises, and it's supposedly W.J. Bissell who came up with the idea of using the California solution. The court couldn't deal with all the lawbreakers, and, and so people just got fed up, took the law into their own hands. San Francisco, the story was, they would say, give somebody 30 days, if they weren't cleared out, they'd be hung and uh, it did the job. If I remember correctly, uh, President Andrew Jackson even extolled this kind of American virtue. If the law is not serving you, then take it into your own hands. There was an American tradition for this. And when the citizens of Waterville got together and said, uh, clearly things are out of hand, we need to do something, um, that was not unusual at that time. That was not out of character with American justice. If Jim Filkins attended those meetings above Bissell's store in the summer of 1865, he may have felt encouraged. It seemed that finally the village was ready to help him fight the Loomis gang by whatever means necessary. I think Filkins was not a very nice man, and I think he had no hesitation at all of breaking the law himself and the belief that he was somehow pushing the law forward. And push is exactly what he would do. It's Halloween, and Dad is planning his yearly mischief. Well, this is my troll under the porch. And, uh, I have a CB horn, and I operate it from inside the house, and I yell at the kids from under the porch, and, and I have a uh, spotlight under there that when they get up in front of it, you know, I flash it on, and it lines them out. You know. Kids talk about this. They've been talking about it for years. Got to go to the house with a talking porch. The holiday is another opportunity to relive our own history. You kids always loved Halloween in Waterville. I mean, it was just a big deal to the point that I gave up cooking a big dinner for Halloween. It was just ridiculous because you didn't want to eat anything. You were too excited. And so I came up with the idea of just having pumpkin burgers, which are regular hamburgers, but I would cut cheese in the shape of jack-o'-lantern faces. And that I could get you to eat. Very nice. While the pumpkin burgers and the jack-o'-lanterns continue, we've outgrown the homemade costumes that were really the stars of every Halloween. Okay, here you go. Today, there are still the classics. There you go. And the shaving creamers. Ooh, gosh, you guys are covered. Ah. And the latest fads. There you go, sweetie. But some things never change. Watch your step there. Hey, watch your step there. Don't step on my fingers. Kids young and old still go for the troll under the porch routine every single year. But be careful now. You see me in here? See my flashlight? There I go. How's that for a flashlight? The only thing missing from Waterville's Halloween is some sort of acknowledgement of this evening's importance in the Loomis calendar. I show you my flashlight. How's that one, huh? What happened on the Pinnacle in 1865 
Beneath the Light of the Witch's Moon, is a true Halloween horror story. Philkins and at least two men um, crept up to the house in the middle of the night. It's very clear that they had come with one purpose in mind, and that was not to arrest anyone. It was to kill Wash and to kill Grove. They called uh, upstairs and or in the window, I forgot which, and got Wash to come down and took him out back and uh, beat him to death. It's alleged that Philkins murdered Wash by actually scalping him, taking his gun and just pummeling his head to the point that it was just a mess of skin and blood and that and Wash was actually scalped. Similarly with Grove, they beat him. Uh, I think there's no question that they intended to kill him as well. And I think they calculated that if they could kill Wash and Grove, the gang probably would fall apart. The following day, local newspapers scream the exciting news. Suddenly, the most powerful man in three counties was gone. We return again to Main Street for a very different parade. The funeral was in November. It was in the Congregational Church in uh, Sangersfield, New York. And people from all walks of life and some of the biggest dignitaries throughout the state came for his funeral. Even as Wash's hearse rolled underneath the vigilante committee's windows, rumors were flying around the village that Fred Hall, Port Terry, and Henry Bissell, the son of W.J., had accompanied Filkins on his grim errand. All were members of the vigilante committee. Filkins by himself, I think, could not do it. Filkins was sanctioned by the Waterville and Sangerfield community, by the leaders of the community. Uh, Filkins was the one to carry it out because he was the one who hated the Loomises. He had gotten to the point that he just had to do something, and that's what he did. Soon after Wash's death, Jim Filkins was indicted for murder. His handcuffs and a broken piece of his pistol had been found at the scene and two gang members, George Jones and Charles Byrd, submitted written affidavits claiming they had seen Filkins on the pinnacle that night. The Loomis gang had only to sit back and watch their enemy fall. But with Rhoda now in charge, the gang was losing control. Members of the Loomis gang knew a family named Crandall over in Leonardsville. The man uh, had quite a bit of money laying around, so they went after the money. And this old man Crandall, 65 years old, ends up getting in a knockdown fight with these three members of Loomis gang. I guess the bullets must not have had as much power as they do nowadays because this man Crandall got one bullet behind the ear, one bullet below the eye, and finally one in the back of the head. And through this shootout, his wife gets shot. He lives and she dies. They never even got the money they, and they killed, you know, a, a woman was killed Killed. The man was terribly beaten and shot, and it did them no good publicity-wise at all. And people said if Wash had been alive, this would never have happened. He didn't want that kind of notoriety. The brutal attack in Leonardsville in December of 1865 was big news. Suddenly, all eyes were on the Loomis gang. It's 1 a.m., and everybody is asleep on Putnam Street, except, that is, for my mother, who is busy preparing a Loomis Gang display. There were plenty of nights like this growing up, Mom staying up long after we had all gone to bed, fussing over every detail. The horse disguising kit, the character biographies, the fur muff, and even the framed map of Waterville. Nothing like taking your home furnishings. Mom's display is a new addition to the Nostalgia Days Festival and seems to be generating some early traffic. 
But back at the Loomis Gang bus tours, concerns about people showing up are put to the test. The first tour is scheduled to depart at 9.30, but there are no takers. A tense waiting game begins. 10 o'clock comes and goes, and only a couple of tickets sell. Still, the road race had some takers earlier in the morning. The craft show is picking up steam, and the chicken is on the grill. All of which is good news for school teacher Brian Bogan, who is one of the organizers. The reason Nostalgia Days came about is uh, those of us who graduate from colleges were always getting solicitation from the alumni councils and so on and so forth. We said, you know, we feel that we should uh, start up an alumni group like that and give them some reason to come back. Well, then the idea came up, well, the Loomis gang, the hop industry. These are things that Waterville are noted for. These are some things that we have all in common. It could be a, a fun thing. Next tour out is at 10.30. Loomis gang bus tours. By 10.30, Dad has sold 13 tickets, just enough to well, send the first bus. The mouth loud enough. All the kids, please sit down in the bus. <laughs> I usually play the part of Pilkins, and uh, Pilkins was the sheriff that did the Loomis's in. Hi, everybody. Welcome. The slow morning is soon a distant memory as the bus tour starts selling out. Please get aboard. My son is filming this. That's why we have a cameraman in here. There aren't an awful lot of buildings um, that I can show you that relate to the Loomises, mainly because uh, some of them have been, been destroyed. Mom's disclaimer points to the only bummer about the tour, very few historical structures. For instance, the Filkins house was torn down years ago, and its corner property was bought by St. Bernard's Catholic Church where I spent most Sundays of my childhood, and nearly every holy day of obligation, too. A small statue of St. Francis of Assisi now stands on the spot. Of course, there is what's left of Bissell's store and George Loomis's sister's house, but I think it's the pretty drive and the stories that sell the tickets. Most people think that the Loomis's sugar bush, where they would tap for maple syrup, was down here in Tinker Hollow. They were making maple syrup in the spring, like most people do. And that night, Rhoda made pancakes for supper. They all became violently ill. Someone had tried to do away with the Loomises by poisoning their maple syrup. We're going to cross the swamp area. Now, this cemetery right here, there's the man, black man that's buried up there. He was going to go to town and tell everything he knew about the Loomises if they didn't pay him the salary that they owed him. And so they sent him down in the back lot to do some work down there, and while he was there, they killed him. Whew, I'm not even sticking to my notes. <laughs> Thanks for coming to Nostalgia Days. We appreciate your support. Nobody else? Ready to roll? After eight trips and nearly 150 paying customers, the Loomis Gang Tours are declared a modest success for another year. We're going right out. This one's filled. It's a popular attraction. On the Nostalgia Days and the Loomis Gang Tours, we've raised $50,000 and we've, uh, we give up two, three thousand dollars every year to our seniors. We're trying to take something bad and put, a, put it to good use. Call me anytime. At the end of the day, the festival receives a surprise visitor, Roseanne Loomis Gay, who is probably the closest living relative of the Loomis family. Oh, you're going to be on camera again. There you go. Well, I think it's a, a great comparison to how they lived in those days to compare today. Now, our young people get bored, and that's probably what satisfied Wash to sell those horses. Today, most of our young people go to dope. They don't have such a thing as horses, just the dope they go to when they're bored from good families. Of the Loomis boys, the one most often avoided in polite conversation is Theodore Wheeler Loomis, who fled to Canada in 1863 to avoid being prosecuted for the rape of a mentally disabled girl. In Canada, Wheeler married and had a family. Roseanne is Wheeler's granddaughter. 
10 years ago, I was over in uh, Richfield Springs and some man stepped up to me and he said, uh, you're a Loomis? I said, yes. He said, well, I had the pleasure of meeting somebody who was the fifth cousin. Well, I said, I am the grandniece of Watch Loomis. And he, he was very surprised. You should have seen the look on his face. Like her infamous ancestors, Roseanne has a horse fetish and a great interest in education. I went to Oswego State Teachers College and I uh, received my master's degree there, but I preferred to travel, my husband and I, so I did not finish the doctorate degree in education. It was easy to get the Loomis history because my father would always tell stories about it. And he liked to tell of all the good things they did and how they helped people and all that. He was very good at telling them that way. For Roseanne, the Loomis history is devoid of the bad parts. Probably the way Rhoda and her clan, in fact most of us, would like to be remembered. They didn't steal the horses. They had some black people or white people that stole horses. And those horses were sold and they used the money for uh, whatever they wanted to use. But they did an awful lot for the poor. Now, why did Wheeler originally go to Canada? Well, that was never discussed, uh, but they just figured out it'd be easier living out there. Out on bail and with his murder trial delayed for months, Jim Filkin showed no signs of giving up. In June, he received a tip that Loomis gang member Bill Elverd had arrived on the pinnacle with some stolen horses. Filkins formed a posse and stormed the Loomis homestead one more time. The sheriff traded shots with Elverd on the darkened stairway, then chased him outside. He started in the house and carried out into the barnyard, and animals were dead, and Filkins again this time was bullet busted his arm and you know, knocked him unconscious. This was the second time Filkins had been shot by the Loomis gang, and word of his latest heroics quickly spread. The Madison County Observer noted that the people of Waterville were, quote, discussing the affair by crowds upon the street corners. It may have taken a while, but throughout this small village, hatred against the gang had finally reached a crescendo. I think the community expected that when Wash was killed, that that would be the end of the Loomis's. And, and it probably should have been. Um, I think it was only Rhoda's greed and her uh, stubbornness that led them to go on after that. In the early morning hours of June 17th, a week after the shootout, a crowd of men more than 100 strong crept up the Loomis Pinnacle and surrounded the house. They had volunteers from not just Waterville, but you know, Hamilton and Morrisville, the whole surrounding area these people came. They brought out Plum, they brought out Grove, and started putting a noose around their neck. You know, when you have three or four people going out there, uh, people don't want any part of it. When all of your neighbors are going too, they say, oh yes, come along, it's gonna become a, a party, a parade. And indeed, it was a lynching party. They had a, a meeting spot farther down, and then they all converged on the house. And when the Loomises saw that many men, they didn't really even try to um, resist, they just, sort of gave up. It said that Rhoda got down on her hands and knees and said, you know, I've never prayed before, but she did pray when they were hoisting Plum up. While one group of men applied the California solution, another set fire to the Loomis home. Rhoda and her daughters would run in and take things out, oh, kegs of uh, maple syrup and things that they wanted to keep. And they would ask the men outside, here, just take this and put it out on the lawn and the men would take it from them. And then the minute they'd run in the house, they threw it right back into the house. And look what we have here. The limb from which they hung Plum Loomis. In the movies, people when hung die instantly. Not so with Plum Loomis. The mob raised and lowered him three times demanding that he name names in a host of local crimes. After passing out twice, Plum finally talked, and his life was spared. Grove was, uh, he, he was real smooth, real classy guy. But after seeing his brother strung up three times near death, 
All they did was tie the rope around his neck and he basically started pleading for his life and we'll follow the law from now on, leave us alone. Um, I suspect that everyone who was there that night told their grandchildren about it till the day they died. I think the Loomis's themselves were probably terrified. I think they had every reason to believe that they were all going to be killed and I think there were a lot of people in the crowd who would have gladly killed them. Uh, so that whether or not they were going to live, I think was an open question until the very end. They ended up with literally the clothes on their backs uh, was all they had left after that night. And most people say they, as the uh, lawmen rode away, you could see Rhoda and the children were here just sitting on the, the fence watching them go. They had nothing. I wonder if it occurred to Rhoda and her children as the sun rose that morning that the war which had delivered so much to the gang had just taken it back. To the Civil War, it was a good cause with a capital G, capital C on it. So not only did the Loomises not fight themselves and harbor deserters, they profited enormously from the war. At the same time, they engendered uh, increasing hostility. And the longer the war went on, I suspect the angrier that people in the community got. While there is more to say about the Loomis family, this vigilante act was the official end of the Loomis gang. It's more than 130 years later. We now live in an age in which towns and villages everywhere are busy luring tourists to their historical treasures, redefining their identities with museums and halls of fame. Wizard of Oz author Frank Baum was born in Chittenango, New York, and the town has responded with a yellow brick sidewalk and Oz cream. And North Terrytown in New York's Hudson Valley even went so far as to change its name to Sleepy Hollow to capitalize on Washington Irving's fictional tale. But the real life downfall of one of the most prolific crime syndicates in American history really hasn't caught on. They just have not been glamorized in a movie or something like that, like Jesse James and some of your other criminals. Uh, I mean, we didn't know about the Gambinos and all that until they made the Godfather movies and so on. Now everybody can understand the structure and can relate to those types of stories. I think the, uh, the basic pattern of the village and area has changed considerably over from early days here because now it's more of a bedroom type community here so that the uh, awareness and the desire for learning the basic history might not be there as well as it, it should be. Um, it may be that the natives take the history for granted too or never found it very interesting in the yeah. first place or were told by their ancestors to ignore it. It was bad. I think people were also not proud that uh, they had had so much vigilantism there. Uh, not only did you have a law enforcement official going out and killing someone, but you had the surrounding communities coming together and hanging plum and burning down the house. This is not something you go out and boast about, at least in the first few generations. As Roseanne Gay once told Dorothy D'Angelo, the stigma against the Loomis gang was, at one time, very real. When she was in school, she was a very bright child, and I believe uh, got an A in a subject, but the teacher wouldn't allow her to have that mark because she was a Loomis and gave her a lower grade. And that's, that's sad to uh, uh, penalize a person for their, their ancestors. When I was a kid, this old school housed the Waterville Historical Society the most logical organization to promote the Loomis Gang legend. But the group was forced to move out when the building became too dilapidated. The now itinerant historical society has also had trouble getting fresh blood. I'm one of the youngest members. The society is mostly senior citizens. It's really up to my generation and people behind me to step up to the plate and that's where we're we're just not getting people they I think they're involved either with their children or with their jobs or other things but they don't see the value in preserving history so what became of the people involved in the Loomis gang saga 
Well, Jim Filkins did eventually stand trial for the murder of Wash Loomis at the Oneida County Courthouse in Rome, New York. His lawyer was Roscoe Conkling Jr., a flamboyant U.S. Senator who had run up against the Loomis gang as a district attorney earlier in his career and still held a grudge. As the trial began, Conkling simply asked that the court set aside the indictment entirely because the two eyewitness accounts submitted by gang members Jones and Byrd were now, in fact, denied by both men. The following day, June 4th, 1867, the judge threw out the indictment and Jim Filkins was a free man. The Loomises had defeated themselves. Despite the fact the evidence was overwhelming, they overplayed their hand terribly and basically played right into Roscoe Conkling's hand uh, by being able to discredit some of the testimony that was given on the affidavits. Conkling was able to basically get him off in what was really, I mean, really an outrageous miscarriage of justice. In 1879, at the age of 55, Jim Filkins had had enough. He hung up his badge and took a job as a night watchman in the nearby city of Utica. He died of natural causes in Waterville on January 4th, 1893. He enjoyed going after the Loomises. It was uh, probably the top of his law enforcement, uh, doing the notorious Loomis gang in. After that, it was all over with, it, you know, his challenge. Probably the challenge is over. You know, he, he died of a ripe old age and uh, they took him up there and they buried him. And they, if, you, if you look at the headstone, it's facing right towards their homestead. And even though he's dead, he's still watching that homestead, watching the Loomises up on that hill. Waterville law enforcement calmed down quite a bit after Filkins. When I was a kid, the lone police officer also drove the village garbage truck, bringing a very literal meaning to cleaning up town. As for W.J. Bissell, he dismantled the vigilante committee and returned to a shopkeeper's life. And soon after my parents bought our house, they found this plaque while rummaging around in the attic. It turns out that this was W.J. Bissell's home, which he built in 1871 and died in in 1898. It's early on Christmas morning, and my father is delivering his yearly present to the birds who didn't fly south. An hour later, as our family history dictates, we descend the stairs in search of presents. My family has always been big on power tools and sharp knives, but there are always a few surprises. By afternoon, when the rest of the family has arrived, it is becoming a very white Christmas. A good snowstorm has a way of making everything look clean, and the winter snows of 1867 probably covered the remains of the Loomis homestead, as if nothing had ever happened. Grove Loomis moved to a small house on the edge of Nine Mile Swamp. He took ill in March of 1878, and as a dying request, asked that the 18th verse of Revelations 1 be read at his funeral. Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Denio, the youngest of the Loomis brothers, continued stealing horses and running from the law until 1876, when a stroke left him disabled. He died in January of 1880 and was buried in Sankerfield. 
The Waterville Times noted, Denial Loomis, who has been more dead than alive for several months past, shuffled off this mortal coil recently and was planted at the center Tuesday of this week. What shall the harvest be? Rhoda sort of reinvented herself like only she could. It is said that by the time she passed away in 1887, at the age of 94, local children referred to the sweet old lady they knew as Grandma Lewis. Cornelia, the outlaw queen, was eventually dethroned when she was relieved of $50 by pickpockets on a train ride. In November of 1893, she suffered a stroke and died. She was 72. After his near-death experience at the end of a rope, Plum Loomis became something of a novelty in Waterville, showing off the rope burns on his neck. He died after a brief illness in August of 1903. He was 69. The last Loomis was Wheeler, who died in Canada of cancer in 1911, and only then finally came home. When Theodore Loomis died in Canada in 1911, his body was brought back here to the Sangerfield Cemetery and laid to rest. His stone, which is in not very good shape, reads Theodore W. Loomis, 1831 to 1911, and it was erected by his son, William. It also says father up on top. The rest of the Loomises are also buried in this cemetery, but their graves are unmarked. And the story is, is that they wished that their graves to remain that way so that no one could damage them after they had been buried. But it's been my theory for years and after talking with people that I think they're buried over in that left-hand corner in the Preston plot because Clarissa Loomis Preston was the sister of George Washington Loomis. Glory days don't last. And in Waterville, the things that once reminded me of them are also disappearing. The local hop industry was devastated by something called the blue fungus around the turn of the 20th century. And prohibition in the 1920s was the final straw. Today, most hops for American beer are imported from Europe. And of the dozens of distinctive hop barns that once dotted the surrounding hills, only two remain. Farmers in the area will now try anything to stay in business. George Eastman never put Waterville on the map. His family left the village for Rochester when he was seven. The house he was born in on Stafford Avenue was eventually picked up and moved to a museum near his adopted city. A parking lot sits on the site. The old schoolhouse and historical society building was eventually bought for some unknown reason by the ambassador to the United States from the Middle Eastern country of Qatar. The roof was then damaged when a rogue tornado ripped through town in 1996, and it was eventually torn down. Waterville, like lots of other places, is in danger of becoming a village of historically significant empty lots. If I was younger and starting over again, I'd, I, I would work on starting a Loomis Museum. Well, you think you're too old now to have a museum? Is that the... Yeah, yeah, I think so. I... It's time for the younger ones to go ahead and do it. I think, I think it would be great. I just think there's a, there's a great story for this. 
and it's going to happen. It just hasn't happened yet because little old Warble may not have had the, uh, the right person in the right place to make this happen. But I do believe it will happen sometime. I have thought from time to time that somebody should purchase the Loomis land and rebuild the house as a museum. It's very real. The, the land around has changed very little. Uh, Sangerfield Water Villa changed very little. I have a cousin, Elizabeth Seaman, who was excommunicated from the Watkins Glen Baptist Church because she had an unchristian walk. I can't change that, but I'm not going to negate it either. That's the whole crux of, of history. It happened. Let's not hide it. I'm very proud of my family because they were all healthy, intelligent, and I'm grateful that I inherit a lot of those genes. All those things mean a lot to you when you're in college. You can go right ahead and do things for yourself. For our children's sake, I think we should understand our roots because we should pass those on. So I, I think it's very important to have a knowledge of things from the past and then view today's happenings many times with that, in that light. How, how did people deal with things that, then? How should we deal with things now? It's Easter, a year since I began making this film, and things are happening. My father, the Easter Bunny, has been named the new president of the Waterville Historical Society. And his first official act was to put mom in charge of all special events. And it looks like Waterville is planning to build a new municipal building on the site of the old schoolhouse. The Historical Society may get the use of the old village hall across the street when it becomes obsolete. It would be their first headquarters in almost 20 years. Brian Bogan has told me that the theme of this year's Nostalgia Days will be Waterville in the 1860s. More chances for people to stare out the window of the Loomis tour bus and imagine. You're going to see the present Waterville time. Right. I am beginning to believe that it may not be enough just to know history. Pieces of history, especially small ones, are fragile and can only be kept alive when people talk and write and perform and believe. Even our Easter egg hunt does not continue by chance. It's because we actively participate every single year. Sure, it's embarrassing, but it's much too late to stop now. On your mark, get set, go. Thank you.